but boy, this is a nice crowd and uh, not a lot of sports-oriented people. By the way, I'm Jim Milliken. I'm the chair of the Concord Historical Society, not New Hampshire Historical Society, your very own Concord Historical Society. In our office, by the way, is on the second floor, right over here in the, uh, in the uh, building here. Uh, we are really fortunate to have a great program this evening and some folks who really know the history of uh, hockey in Concord. We're uh, really pleased they all agree to be here. But if I was to add up all the ages, uh, should I do that? No. <laughs> Wait, we have the 200. <laughs> But uh, part of uh, what we usually do to introduce people, by the way, we've been around for about 15 years now, and uh, we're in the process of gathering things for our archives and so forth. But you probably won't see a museum for Concord because we've got the New Hampshire Historical Society and other places in Concord. There's one at the police station. There's one at the fire department, for example. Uh, museums, and sometimes you may want to try to get in and see those. But we're more like, uh, I'm looking for that right word, we're the place you call to find out where to find more of the history of clearing house is the word I should be using. So we're glad you're here tonight. There are a couple of things I should encourage you to do. One, over here you can join the uh, Historical Society. I think it's all of 25 bucks or something like that, so I, I don't think that'll break you if you'd like to do that. But also, we have a history book, and this is the history book that was chaired, uh, well, by myself, but it was, the author is actually John Milne. John Milne was a, a, a newspaper person who worked out of the State House for many years, and uh, along with a whole bunch of other local people who wrote this book, and this is the history of the 20th century. And I really encourage you, we've got a special deal on those over here uh, tonight. But just, I happened to grab it, and the sports section is somewhere around page 130 or something like that. And the very first page of the sports section as uh, the St. Paul's School uh, uh, hockey area back in the early part of the century. Whoops, you okay, John? <laughs> and on uh, a couple of pages later, believe it or not, we got Doug Everett here. And I don't have to tell you who Doug Everett is. All I can say is a little boy, I had the wonderful experience of him coming to uh, a church event, and uh, he was kind enough to show me the silver medal that they that they won. And that's right now at the Historical Society, and if you've got the right connections, I think you could probably get that out of there for a, for an event if you needed to do that. There are still two living girls, uh, his children in town. Uh, one of them is Cynthia Everett White. And, uh, oh, and I just forgot the other person's name, the other girl. Uh, I'll take it in a second. And uh, nice, nice people. So Doug Everett is on to win there a couple of pages. And lo and behold, what we come to is Tara Mounsey. Now, how do you beat that? I mean, hasn't Concord really done its part in the world of hockey? I'm pretty proud of our community, quite frankly. And to even touch another a mark, Doug Walsh is listed in here as well. If you go to the index, it's an excellent index. I suspect you're going to find a bunch of people that you know. So these are on sale tonight, and I strongly encourage you. It's a, 60, uh, 59 and a 59.50 book, I think it was. They're $20 tonight for this event. I don't think you can lose up on that so, legends, New Hampshire legends of hockey. 
Well, the way we're handling this tonight, Jim Hayes is going to be moderating uh, a discussion with four <coughs> folks that uh, know their stuff, and I'm going to let him introduce them. So, Director uh, Hayes, go for it. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to the Concord Historical Society podcast on the history of hockey here in Concord, New Hampshire. Uh, I'm Jim Hayes, as he said, and before we get started with our guest introductions, I'd like to acknowledge and thank a couple of people. First of all, and I see him here tonight, Ken Kale for his help in promoting tonight's event yesterday on his WKXL radio show. Thank you, Ken. Thank, thank you to Hunk O'Connell. Hunk has provided to the Legends of Hockey, and perhaps others, some of the video that you'll see tonight, some video clips, particularly from White Park and at St. Paul's School. And uh, we also wish uh, a speedy recovery for Hunk. He had a, a bad stroke and was in critical condition, but I understand he's better at this time. And I was told uh, by a local guy that he'd be moving into a, uh, a nursing home afterwards for assisted living, certainly. And lastly, to Bill Jennings of Bedford Community Television Station. Uh, Bill took all our DVDs that we have and reformatted them into MP4 files and then edited them further uh, for tonight's uh, presentation. I'm joined by our four panelists who have long, successful, various, varied associations with hockey here in New Hampshire, particularly in Concord. It's my pleasure to introduce Ken McKinnon, Bob Norton, George Chase, and Dunk Walsh. A warm welcome to each of you and thanks for being with us tonight. Many of our viewers and listeners will likely know you from your long association, uh, but let me take a few minutes to share a few more details, particularly with the viewers at home. Ken, Ken, you were from UNH, you were at UNH from 1958 to 1962 and had the distinction of being the first Canadian re recruited there. You wore the C in your senior season and still hold the record for most goals in a game with six. You played on three teams, two teams out of Concord, the Shamrocks and the Coachman, before adding another 12 years in the Capital City Hockey League as well as the Laconia Hockey League and officiated for about 30 years. You coached the Tide at Concord High School and you were the founder and president of the Granite State Hockey League in the early to mid 60s. So Ken, with 60 plus years of local hockey history in and around Concord, who are the major influences that promoted the local hockey scene when you were here? I say, Jim, when I first came to Concord, um, I originally from UNH, I was I planned to go back to Toronto and be, become a, going into teaching and be, being a coach. But uh, when I looked at the geography, I said uh, I'd, li I'd like to see if I get an application to Concord. So I put an application in there and talked to Harlan Abbott and the superintendent, saying I'd like to um, see if I could do any coaching or whatnot there. And so, sure enough, I got a contract uh, to come to Concord, and uh, very very happy. One of the best decisions I ever made in my life. Um, the first year at Concord High was uh, as assistant coach to Paul um, um, Dupont. 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 Oh, yeah, Paul, Paul Dupont. He was a uh, he was a he was in the in the school system and he had been a, he played up at St. Michael's College in Vermont. So my position would be assistant coach to Paul the first year, and then he got a principalship I think at Walker School. So I took over the the, the head coaching job. Uh, in my second year there, but uh, with regard to uh, the major influences here when you arrived uh, for hockey, besides yourself in the Granite State Hockey League, being the president and also a player for the Concord Shamrocks, who were some of the people during those Shamrock years, coachmen, and from what you saw, the Eastern Olympics that uh, made a major impact in the city of Concord. Well, you have to go back and look at Russ Martin, Steve Winship, and Malcolm McLean, the mayor. Uh, they were the ones that put together the Douglas and Everett Arena. And uh, 
after, after my first year here, somebody told me that they, they built a, an arena down in Manchester in JFK, so we, we went down there to take a look at it, and sure enough, that was a great facility to start off with the Grand State Hockey League. And, um, um, but, 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 but Russ and Malcolm and uh, Steve really got, got going on the Douglas, Douglas and Everett Arena. They were the ones that guided it. And, uh, you know, Manchester already had their rink, so people in Concord want to have, have a rink also. So they put together the plans to, to, to make that happen. Terrific. Thank you. Bob Norton, Bob, your resume in hockey broadcasting is extensive. First on New Hampshire Public Television and later on New England Sports Network with Sean McDonough handling the Hockey East games. You spent six seasons as, at UNH as Charlie Holt's assistant coach and prime recruiter, then moved to Concord in 1976 where you were coach, or a coach and the president of the Concord Youth Hockey Association for a year. You've also received two New England Emmy Awards, 1979 and 89, and also a Hockey East Media Award in 2004. So your involvement and exposure is wide ranging. Describe for us what was happening with hockey in those years and what is so special about that. Well, you know, when I first came here, uh, UNH was probably six years away from an outdoor rink. Uh, Snively Arena had just been built, so that just showed you where hockey was in the state of New Hampshire when uh, the best hockey team in the state was playing in an outdoor rink. But I find it interesting uh, when Kenny talked about Russ. I moved over here from uh, UNH, and you know, Russ was a great athlete at UNH. He was a Great football player, he's in the Hall of Fame at UNH. Terrific athlete from Massachusetts. He grew up in Marblehead. Uh, my coach at Rutgers used to say that was the town of Massachusetts that was named after me. <laughs> <laughs> but when I first came here, Russ took me out to lunch and uh, he said he wanted me to get involved in the youth hockey program. It was important to him and they just built a rink and they needed young people who were interested in hockey to get involved in the youth hockey program. Now, I had a four-year-old and a two-year-old who I had just taken to a Brady Concord High game. And that was back when Brady Concord High was crazy. And my kids walked out of that rink wanting to play hockey. So Russ talking to me about getting involved in, as, a, as a coach in youth hockey was right where, what I was looking for. And when you talk about hockey in uh, Concord, Russ Martin, Mel McLean, uh, Mr. Winship, those guys, without them, hockey would not have grown to the level that it's grown. Uh, their contribution, building a rink, was instrumental. And when you know when you talk about rinks, most of the hockey prior to that was outdoors. When you go all around New England and all around the areas where hockey grew, uh, where they talk about Barville, Rhode Island, and one socket Rhode Island and Providence, uh, you talk about Lewis and Maine and St. Dom's and Berlin and Notre Dame. And they were all rinks built by communities because the private schools had the indoor rinks. The poor kids didn't have any indoor rinks. They skated outdoors. There were no indoor rinks. Kids here, the old rick rats here in Concord, they uh, skated down the parking lot of Sacred Heart School or a Sacred Heart Church. They skated up at White Park. They had no rinks. The rinks were at St. Paul's. The money had the rinks. The kids with no money had nothing until Russ Martin and those guys came along and built the rink. And whenever you go to these places that uh, uh, had great hockey, it's interesting to me that there was always a contrast between the wealthy kids who played the private schools and the other kids whether you're talking about Minnesota, where Ryan Brandt played out in Roseau or Hibbing or, uh, or all of those places, Lake State, Lake Superior, those places where, kid, where kids started off in outdoor rinks. And, uh, those guys putting us in an indoor rink here in Concord was absolutely instrumental to the growth of the game. <coughs> Terrific. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Dunk, you are a fixture at the Allen Arena playing at all levels throughout the Concord Youth Hockey Association before heading off to Bishop Brady 
1977, and then the Plymouth State College, he ranked second on their all-time scoring list with an impressive record of 62 goals, 75 assists, and 137 seven points, and are now in the Panthers Athletic Hall of Fame as of 1999. He became an assistant coach in 86-87 for the Tide before taking over as head coach uh, in 1990-91 for the Tide, where you've been there for 32 years and counting, uh, with an impressive record of 537 wins, 184 losses, and 22 ties. Your teams that you have coached appeared in 14 state championships while capturing nine of those. Dunk, looking back, what does it mean to you to be such a part of a long hockey tradition in Concord? Well, Jimmy, thanks. Um, it means a lot, obviously. Growing up here, um, you know, we, we were at White's Park playing boot hockey or playing on our skates, um, and then you know, I had friends that were going to Concord High, but a couple of my buddies were going to Brady, and it, w it really came down to I did not like run the junior high school. It was too big, so I went to Brady, um, which was probably the best thing that happened to me because I could play as a freshman, where if I had gone to Concord, I probably wouldn't have got to play until sophomore. And oh, although Tilly tells me I never would have made that team, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> but, but, um, <laughs> but I know I would have, but whatever. But, so I went to Brady and played for Bud LeCurn, and... I mean, and like Bob Norton said, the rivalry back then was insane. It was so great in the seventies, and like even kid, like our kids that I coach now, even ten years ago, like we'd play Brady, and there'd be six, seven hundred people, and people, oh, the place was packed. And I'm thinking to myself, you guys have no idea what it was like, and it was just amazing playing in those games. Um, so then, you know, I went to college, and and um, I knew I wanted to coach, um, and get out of college, and and uh, there was an assistant. Uh, coaching job slash JV coach and Mr. Harbert was the AD still and hired me and I mean I had no idea that 37 years later I'd still be doing it but it's something I've always enjoyed I, I love coaching and I've never looked at it as a job and, and they actually pay me so it's it's never like you know that I can I can count on one hand how many times in the last 33 years as a head coach where I'm like oh we got practice that it just doesn't happen because it's enjoyable and yeah and there's years that we're not as good, or you don't have as 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 a good as good a group, kid wise. You know, I mean, but I've been fortunate. I've had great assistant coaches and and good players, and none of that good kids. Good, you know. And I and I talk to a lot of coaches. Oh, the parents, this the parents. That. I, I've been so lucky. I can tell you, our parents, like I, I just they don't bother me, and they they just let us coach. And so I've been really really blessed. And you know, so it means a lot to, for me to be part of. You know the history of Concord High hockey, and um, even though I'm a Brady guy, um, you know it, it means a, a lot to me, and, and and hopefully I can do it a few more years. Excellent. I do have one follow-up question on that. Uh, you mentioned Bud LeCurn. I was wondering if you could tell uh, the people here uh, what it was like to play for Bud LeCurn, as as I witnessed and heard. Uh, there was probably no coach around that got more out of his players than Bud LeCurn and the great LeCurn family, of course, is local here to Concord. Yeah, absolutely. Bud was, um, he was one of a kind and, um, you know, he wasn't an X's and O's guys. He was just a motivator and, and like we've all played for coaches, whatever sport that we, we didn't like. But I can honestly say I've never had a kid that I played with at Brady, or even a kid that played after me or before me that played for Bud that said, "Oh, I didn't like Bud LeCurd. He was he was the best, motivates you. He got the most out of every kid." And and Bud was always like Brady's a small school, and we were even when Brady was good, like we, we were pretty good in high school. We got to the finals twice, but we were always the underdog because we were a small school, and we relied on like we had Bruce Gillies as our goalie, we had Johnny DiNapoli, a really good player. And then we'd have a handful of other guys that were okay. And then we had another handful of guys that, that were overachieving because of our coach. And he, he, was, he, he, he could push the right buttons better than anybody had ever been around. And he was, he was special. And um, today, would he survive? No chance. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't last long today. But um, he was the best. I, I loved him. And, and um, just, I, I just I think back to those days. And he, he was, some of the things he said that... <laughs> 
today. Oh my God! But he was he was he was a great and, and a lot of people in here know Bud and he was great. He was like he, he just wanted to win for him so bad and and he came, you know he came across as this gruff you know tough guy which he was but but he cared about the kids so much and, and um, just a great guy. Tell him what time you practiced. We practiced in the morning, which was, you know, but there's teams that do that still, but, but, and Bud was old school, like if you, if you will, you know, it could easily happen, your alarm doesn't go off, and you, 5.30, and you get there at 5.32, and Bud was, doors gone, see ya, you're not getting on the ice, um, I remember one time, it was my senior year, we weren't that good, we had, Bruce had graduated, and we, we were okay, and then one of these kids, he was a kid from Laconia, and, um, between the second and third period, we're playing Dover over there. They were a brand new team. We're supposed to be winning by four or five goals. At the end of the second, it's like one to one. And the parent came over to Bud and said, Hey, yeah, uh, coach, since, since uh, I'm not going to say the kid's name, since um, he's not going to play, can I take him now? <laughs> and Bud said, Take him and don't ever bring him back. <laughs> so, but Bud was, like I said, today, he did, it wouldn't last long. <laughs> It'd be front page of the monitor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great, uh, great addition to, to the story. story. Uh, George, your father taught and coached at St. Paul's School, and you grew up right there on campus at St. Paul's, just three or so miles from here. You also played youth hockey at White Park, and I had the good fortune of playing with you when I was a senior, you were a freshman on the Crimson Tide for Concord High School. When you attended Milton Academy, you left your Concord friends behind and ended up playing against some of them. Maybe you can tell us what it was like to play against a bunch of your Concord local buddies. <laughs> Especially big rivalry between Bowden and Colby. And, uh, Three guys from Colby were from Concord. Carl Methan, Carl Lovejoy, and Tommy Pancha, who's, I think, here. Uh, so that made those games, the, the rivalry, even better than ours. So, yeah, I can't tell you how much fun that was. Yeah. That's terrific. Uh, your junior and senior years at Bowdoin College, you played for legendary Sid Watson. Friend of Bob's, yeah. And won the Division II National Championship in your senior year before heading off to play some hockey in Ontario, I understand. And then you moved to a beautiful town of Aspen, Colorado, where you played five seasons, maybe did some skiing also, uh, in the Rockies for the Leafs. After teaching at the Dexter School when returning, in Brookline, Mass., you ultimately came back to St. Paul's in 1992, where you taught until 19, uh, 2019. You partnered initially with Matt Soule of the boys' varsity hockey team, as well as coaching the boys' JV, girls' JV, in the last 17 years with the girls' varsity team. With with Ken's uh, granddaughter, who's on the team right Who's now. Who's the goalie at Bowden? Uh, Bob Menzies, when we won senior year. I got to yeah. tell you a quick story. Quick story. <laughs> Go ahead. I, when he mentioned that, I just... You know, this is a story about how inexact recruiting is. I had a reputation of being a pretty good recruiter. And I recruited some great players. But I had some major screw-ups. <laughs> I recruited a kid by the name of Rob Menzies out of Sarnia, Ontario. The same year, I recruited uh, Jamie Hislop and Bobby Gould. Pretty good players. But Rob Menzies was a really good goalie. But I had a kid down in Marblehead that I really liked and we needed a goalie. So I was sold on this kid from Marblehead. I will not mention his name because he ended up not being able to play a lick. <laughs> Sid Watson calls me on the phone. Sid and I were like this. I worked at the hockey school there that he and Charlie ran for 20 years. So Sid, have you seen a goalie? They never had any money to recruit. Uh, he used to always come on my dime. And he called me and said, do you have a, a goalie any place that you've seen that can help us? And I said, yeah, there's a kid up in Sarnia that we can't take because we're taking this kid from wherever. 
But I, I really think you ought to go look at it. His name was Rob Menzies. He ends up being an All-American, leads them to the national championship, and I got a guy who couldn't play. <laughs> That's a true story. Hey, thanks for that. I appreciate that. He was very good. Well, I'm sure that was only one of a couple. I don't know. There were a few more. <laughs> we'll hear more later about some of the others besides the ones you mentioned that were on the plus side. Um, having grown up, George, on the campus of St. Paul's School, what are some of the earliest memories of St. Paul's? And were you, at that time, uh, aware of its unique place in the local and national hockey history? Uh, I'm not sure I knew the big picture of, of where the school fit in. But all I remember is every day after school, grabbing my skates and my stick, my gloves, going down to the skate house on the pond, now where the library is, unfortunately, um, and sitting around there, there was this guy who ran the, uh, the skate shop there, uh, his name was Duke, I'm not sure his last name, do you remember Joe Duke? I don't know. He was, uh, he was there sharpening skates, and he always had a fire going in the middle ring there, and I just could not wait after school every day. I'd run down there, grab my skates, uh, and put them on, jump onto the pond. There were like five uh, rinks set up down there. And uh, we'd play until after dark. You couldn't even see the puck. But um, that, 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 was, that, was, that was a lot of fun. Then um, I think it was in uh, maybe the 70s, they closed in the rink, they made it over uh, a roof on that, the uh, outdoor rink there. The Gordon rink. The Gordon rink, yeah. So that was, that was where I spent my, my youth, basically. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, it's great to re relive some of those uh, days and hear more about the hockey histories of yourself. Let's get started with our topic today. We go around uh, the panelists to explore some of your recollections about hockey in and around Concord. First question, uh, and each of you can answer this, I'll pass this right along. Were there any local hockey hero, heroes that you watched in your time in Concord? Or played against or played with? Besides yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to tell you the truth, and I, uh, at, you know, my, my, my playing got limited because uh, I got asked to uh, referee, referee Division One ECAC hockey, and uh, Mr. Nord here can vouch for me. I, I, I did my first Beanpot game. I, I started the game too early. They, they, they usually have a, have, a, have a red light. When you shut the red light off, you drop the puck. Well, I never saw the red light. So I think the game went two minutes over oh, 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 before, before we were ready to go. But, uh, anyway, but uh, no, I, you know, when you, if, if you go back with the Manchester Blackhawks and the Eastern Olympics, you used to have to go to the Everett Arena at 5.30 in the afternoon to line up to go to the game because the, the arena was jam-packed with people, the rivalry was great, and, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of a lot of money going on as far as what what, what what the players were receiving, but it was just just great great good hockey. You think of some of the guys from Manchester, Kangaroo, Kangaroo Hebrew, uh, Normie, uh, um, Shock, uh, Shock Shock the mayor, and uh, Tino Tino the goalie. But the, that was really big big time hockey in, in Concord. What? Yeah, the, uh, I, I coached youth hockey for probably 20 years. Uh, three kids through youth hockey, so that adds up after the Mike Squirts, Pee Wee's, Bams, Midgets, to about 20 years and you had it all up. Would be on the list. She was terrific. One of the things I haven't understood over the years is why that rink, I know the arena is named after uh, ever, but I don't understand why the rink isn't named after her, <laughs> because we don't have many like her. We don't have many that was uh, as, were as good as her, and she played with the boys all the way through. Mm -hmm. And finally, I went to her dad at the end. Of, we played the New England Midget Tournament up in Lewiston, Maine, and Tommy Pancho 
Dick's son was coached with me. And she was, this is the top high school players in New England. And she was the best player in the tournament. And I went to her dad after the game was over, and I said, you know, this ought to be it for her. Because it, the guys are a little too physical, and she's going to get hurt. She's better than all of them, but it's just a question of she's not big enough to survive in this, if this continues. And she went on to be one of the best players in the world. When she won the Olympics in Japan, there wasn't a better hockey player in the world than Tara Mountain. I second that. That was impressive. Um, I remember one guy that, I don't know if anyone remembers him, but I remember one game when I first started playing down at White Park, um, it was kind of uh, throw the puck in the middle of the ice, coach, and uh, play. And um, this guy who I knew casually, but was a little bit older than I was, his name was Mark Stuckey. And um, uh, he was, he's gone on, he went on to have a great career at Princeton and a professional career in Europe and coached there for, and still lives there actually. Um, so he's had a career uh, as a professional player and coach. But I remember vividly when I was seven or eight down at the uh, rink there and I, I was on the ice and he was there and I was stumbling around and and somehow he bumped into me on the boards and he was just dribbling through the whole crowd and he, he hit me he, and he goes, get, uh, what, what are you doing here? You're, you're, you're just choking me up here. Get, get out of my way. You know, you don't know what you're doing. And of course I didn't compared to him. He was going around everyone else. So, um, but that was one of my vivid memories. Uh, he and Eric Eberhardt were probably the standouts in that on that rink that night, but I, I will always remember him being so frustrated when he ran into me and lost the puck, and I had no, no idea what I was doing. So um, he was a great, great guy. Take that back one second. Yeah. Uh, talking about Mark Stuckey, a great, great friend of mine. I'm still in contact with him. He's actually in Austria now, but played 19 years of professional hockey over there. He's married, he's got a couple daughters, and visits his brother in Portland, and one is in Arizona uh, periodically. But I grew up skating at St. Paul's, fortunately, in the early 60s, <coughs> late 50s, uh, and as well as White Park. Yeah. And uh, Mark was one of the first guys who I ever saw curve a hockey stick. We'd boil him in water, he'd put it under the old big radiators against the wall and just bend it, and then put a bunch of books from the probably the St. Paul's Library underneath the other end, and he'd have a hook that was about three inches. It would wrap right around the hockey puck, just about, which uh, back in those days, uh, when, when people started using curved sticks, there were, I don't think there were any limits to how big of a curve he could have. But uh, Mark was slight in size, but very, very strong, and he, he's probably, the last time I saw him, and I'm sure he hasn't changed, he's probably five, seven or maybe eight and about 140 pounds maybe but he's a, a golf pro over in austria now <laughs> easy what was the question again <laughs> is that who we play with or who we coach or who we... yeah i mean i got a story i played um concrete youth hockey and the first year i was on a travel team was 1972 Dr. Berger Carlson was our coach, and so I was a first year squirt. So most of my buddies were a year older than me, Tilly and Beaver Store, and those guys were always second year guys. I was first year guys, so I'd make, you know, I'd play with them for a year. Ken Carlson, obviously. So Berger was, uh, talk about old school. Back then, you could play, you could go to a game and, and not hit the ice because you're playing to win, and even though everybody's paying the same amount of money for youth hockey, it didn't matter back then. Like, Berger wanted to win. And, um, but on that team, and, and you know, we didn't realize till later, but it's amazing. Um, Ken Carlson obviously played in the National Hockey League, and Doug Brown was a kid. His father was a professor at St. Paul's, and Dougie Brown was on that team. He was a year younger than me. I, I think I was a first year squirt, and he was a year younger than me, so, um, but he was that good then. So we had two kids 
on our sport travel team when I was that age that ended up playing the National Hockey League. And Doug Brown had a long career. He won some mm -hmm. cups from Detroit. Um, and Greg Brown's his younger brother. And then they moved to, um, they ended up going to St. Mark's. They, they finally got a job, I think, um, down there. And that's where they went. And then Greg had a great career, played a little bit in the pros. Um, and now he's the head coach of Boston College. So, so that was kind of cool, that, you know, not knowing at the time, but then as years went on, Two of those kids from our sport team played the National Hockey League, which was pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. That's cool. Thank you. Well, Ken, go back to you, Ken. You arrived in Durham in 1958, having played your minor hockey in Toronto. So let's start with this question. Uh, I know you had a rich, Toronto has a rich hockey history, particularly with the Maple Leafs particularly in the 50s and early 60s. Not so much recently, but they're on the rebound. Uh, when you first came to New Hampshire, when did you realize about what a rich hockey history Concord and New Hampshire had? Well, Jimmy, the funny thing is that when I uh, came, came down to UNH, uh, uh, the, the, the plan was I, I, never coached, I never met Coach Pepper Martin. But the plan was uh, when we drove into Durham to give him a call and uh, he would meet my mom and dad and my brother and take me up to the alumni house, which is not there anymore. It got, got, uh, got tore down to probably making, making Paul Smith College. But anyway, so I had a big steamer trunk. So we took the trunk upstairs to the third floor and uh, Pepper told my brother where to go to, to go to motel in Dover. And we didn't have any cell phones at that time. So he said, I'll take you to the rink. And it's like a, a Sunday night, it, it had some drizzle that afternoon. So we go over to the rink, and he puts the lights on. It, it's an outdoor rink. And I'm like, have I made a mistake coming here? <laughs> it, it's all the sand floor, and the weeds growing up in one, one, one inch <laughs> particularly. And my jaw just kind of dropped, and uh, Coach Martin says, well, I know uh, you're, you're a little disappointed, but he said, uh, the legislature is uh, going to be voting to, to, to put a cover on this roof. Put, put, a, put, a, put, a, put, a, put a cover on the rink, pardon me. So that was, that was my first you know, meeting of, 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 of we, we called, they called a bachelor rink. It was artificial ice, but um, I certainly was shocked and thought, you know, maybe I made a big mistake because I had a chance to go to St. Lawrence and uh, I, I chose to come to New Hampshire. And, I didn't know they didn't have any other Canadians there. And uh, <laughs> anyway, we, uh, we 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 had a good time. We had, we had a, a, a tractor with a big broom on to go around and clean the ice, and all the students would jump over there and shovel shovel the snow over the boards. And then uh, at Christmas time, I got called into the uh, director's office, uh, admissions office, Harry Carroll, and he said, <coughs> "Kenny, I knew you're going back to Toronto for Christmas." Um, he reaches in his desk and gives me an application. He said, if you find anybody else that could help our team, let me know. <laughs> so I, I, took that, I took that application with me. I did have one more year of junior hockey, so That's I called up my old coach when I got to Toronto and told him here, here from this date to this date for Christmas recess, and uh, is there any chance they could play for it? He said, sure, yeah, I'd love to have it. He gave me the dates. So on the first game against Unionville, there's the guy Tommy Cannon. Tommy and I had played Pee Wee together, played Bantam, played Midget. So I told my I'm at UNH, a good school academically. I said they gave me another applic they gave me an application, which uh, we're going to play your team in four more in my, in my fourth game. So I'll bring the app up. So I got Tommy to sign up. He came down the next year. We needed a goalie because Rod Blackburn was graduating. So he knew Doug Dunning. So Dougie came down. And then my senior year, Brad Houston, his dad worked with my dad at Eaton's of Canada. He was playing for Toronto Marvels Junior A. So I went home one spring break to watch him at Maple Leaf Gardens, talked him and his girlfriend to coming down. But you have to realize, for all those people I recruited, I did not tell them it was an outdoor ring. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's, uh, that's, that, that, that's my story about, you know, then they, they, they put a roof on snively and away they went. So here we go. Thank you, Kim. Uh, here's an excerpt which came from uh, Deanna Pearl, the archivist at St. Paul's School. And I quote, the oldest publication began in 
June of 1860, fourth issue, volume one, number four, December 1860, there's a mention of skating on the pond there at St. Paul's School. Acknowledged as the cradle of hockey, St. Paul's School hockey has been synonymous since the afternoon of November 17, 1883. It's kind of amazing they were playing hockey in November 17th mm. when we're praying for ice at White Park for the 1883 Black Ice Tournament in a couple of weeks. When the school community gathered on the lower school, school pond to witness the first game ever played in the United States with those rules, the love of the fabled Black Ice was universal and the boys, masters, and their families looked forward to its early arrival. I now uh, have some uh, photos and a video clip of St. Paul's. <laughs> Hobie Baker. This is a group of players from the back. They're up playing up to St. Paul's School, one of their teams. We'll hold there, and this is from uh, at the drop of a puck. From you people, the, the those of you who are from Concord, uh, written by Stephen W. Winship, which was talked about before. Uh, he was a goalie, of course, I believe, at Dartmouth College, and one of the early founders and, uh, and key people to the Concord youth hockey, and later the uh, Everett Arena and those early teams. Concord has for years been called the cradle of American hockey, but long before its first American rules and formal teams took form in this city, boys were engaging in a distinctively fast, invariably broiling contest on skates and local ponds, the Merrimack River, and a place where the organized game started in the United States, St. Paul School. In fact, Annals of a City report, uh, skating was popular in the earliest of times of 1720s in the original hamlet of Penny Cook, spelled Penny, P-E-N-N-Y, C-O-O-K, right here on Horseshoe Pond behind us, which was, at that time, back in the early 1700s, this was Penny Cook down here, which soon became a favorite spot uh, for skaters and skating parties. Those two references certainly sound like the start of organized hockey began in Concord, but was there another era that you experienced hockey in Concord where it simply took off? If you guys wouldn't mind answering that. You know, I think when you look at hockey, uh, hockey in Concord, it really took off about the same time that Hockey took off in the Boston area. In the, in the, when you look at the 70s, uh, late 60s and 70s to so the Bruins, the Bruins had a lot to do with the growth of hockey mm -hmm. in Boston. And if you ride around Boston to this day, you see MDC rinks all over the place. And those all date back to the 60s, about the same time that Everett Arena mm -hmm. and the Manchester Arena were being built. So the growth of the Bruins, really, I think, and the Stanley Cup, the Bruins won back then, I think had a lot to do with the growth of hockey in New England. And as you look around the country and you wonder how hockey players are now coming from Los Angeles and Dallas and Atlanta and places all over the country, almost all of them are connected to the growth of NHL franchises in those areas. Mm -hmm. If you see an NHL franchise going into Seattle, I'll tell you in 10 years, a lot of the real top youth hockey players younger players are going to be coming out of Seattle because that's what's going to happen. It's happened everywhere, and it happened here, and I give a lot of credit to the growth of the Bruins in that Stanley Cup. Yeah, I have one story that I vividly remember, uh, and I think a couple of the guys in this room were at the same game. Uh, and this, imagine this happening today. Okay, I think it was the, uh, the Eastern Olympics, or maybe it could have been the coachman, scheduled a a game against the Bruins. 
you remember this? The Bruins came up. Pi McKenzie, A. Johnson, Fred Stanfield, they were all up here. They came up to do a fund, uh, some sort of fundraiser. And, and we, of course, had been to every game all year. So we're saying, oh man, our Olympics, they can, they can give them a good show. They can, they can play. They're going to be tough against the Bruins. You know, after a period, it was probably 20 to nothing. You know, they, they had to change shirts and make it even. But I remember standing there, probably with John Stevenson, and we were waiting to get our autographs from Pi McKenzie and Johnny Busick and all these guys. And I go, man, this is unbelievable. We're watching the Bruins right here at the Ever Arena. This is the best. I, then I realized hockey was, was here in Concord. I'm saying this was, this was the real deal. Yeah, I don't, I don't really can't talk that. I, the only thing, other thing I can think of was when Berl, uh, Brady beat Berlin 6-5 in the semifinals in 73. That might have been when hockey took off. Uh, no. <laughs> but that, that still is probably the greatest upset in the history of high school sports. Um, and I was, I remember I was, it was a Wednesday night because it was a semifinal. And I had like, I was 10, so I probably had score practice. And I remember being in the car listening to the radio, and Berl, Brady had beaten Berlin 6-5 to go to the finals. With, they had Joe, and they had Cecil, and Mike Garofalo, and a couple other guys. And it, 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 what they beat you during the year, Joe, like 15-2 to two or something? It wasn't close. No. <laughs> but no, obviously, Bobby Orr, 1970. I, I'm, I'm, I was seven in 1970, so that's... I, mean, I can remember when, like, so many kids started playing hockey and, and you know, TV 38 and the Bruins, so obviously that was, that was the, um, the real reason, but that's still the greatest hot, uh, upset in the history of high school sports, in my opinion. <laughs> I'll tell you a quick sideline about that game. I was there scouting the game with Coach Holt, and uh, we were scouting Cecil, because Cecil was special. What about Joe? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Every time I see Joe, he says the same thing to me. You ended my career, you cut me. <laughs> but anyway, Cecil was unbelievable. And I asked Coach Holt at the game, what, and Cecil eventually came to play for us as a freshman, did not exactly have a love affair with his books. So was, <laughs> <laughs> but he was the best kid. He was a terrific kid and a great player. But I asked Coach Holt at the end of the game, I said, what do you think of Cecil? He says... I can't believe it. He never came off the ice. He played yeah. the entire game. And he only came in his own for end zone face yeah. right? Yeah. 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 Only half the ice. Yeah. So we're going to play half the game. The defensive, he was a stranger to the defensive zone. Yeah. Not unlike yourself, I might add. <laughs> Thank you for sharing those stories. <laughs> White Park, that's located less than three miles from the ponds at St. Paul School. The city of Concord received a gift of land from Amenia White in memory of her husband, Nathaniel. The deed for White Park was conveyed to the city of Concord in 19, uh, 1884. I'm sorry, 1884. He was a businessman involved with transportation, hotels, and banking, the founder of the American Express Company. White Park sits on 23.4 acres and defined by the five residential streets, Washington Center, White, Liberty, and Beacon. It's a beautiful piece of land with steep slopes and a high water table. In the mid to late 1880s, the renowned landscape architect Charles Elliott designed the park. Two ponds were excavated to help direct the flow of the water from the freshwater springs on the hillside. We've got some photos and video from White Park to show at this time.
black guys. Go <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I say. say. Oh, Three Sam. Steve Winter and Russell Mott. This is the uh, Mount Rockingham. Playing for the Colonia. Ken McKinnon going up the ice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Smooth as ever. Smooth as ever. <laughs> Look at him. He's afraid to dish it, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> That's a puck, Kenny. No need. Yeah. Uh, John Hunter and John Eisner. John Eisner. Miley Sweeney bringing yeah, the puck up the ice. Many other senior hockey teams played out of Concord. The Millville Bruins, of course, played right out of Hockington, but played many a games here in Concord. Uh, the White Park Hockey Club, the Concord Hockey Club, the Shamrocks, of course, the Coachman, the Eastern Olympics, and the Budman as well as Sacred Heart, which is shown there. I'd like to hear more about your experiences with any of those teams that you might have either played against, probably, well, Ken, we can maybe address this to you, uh, or even watched. That could be many of you. Uh, there were some exciting times and big rivalries. Some were touched on already. Concord Manchester probably being the biggest for a senior. Uh, Amateur hockey. Ken, you want to address that? I think I'm going to pass the uh, pass, pass the mic here on on, on the board. No, that, that's fine. I'm too young. I didn't see those. Yeah, games. I, I didn't want to see it. <laughs> you sure trying to see some of that? I'm too young. I haven't seen those. <laughs> I only was watching my dad play. He played for the Shamrocks and the uh, Co Coachman. But um, I, I was not in town when, those, when I was old enough to play for them. Yeah, I, I remember catching the tail end of the Eastern Olympics, but it was like 71 or 72, and it wasn't quite, I guess, what it was you know, the previous couple of years. The Budman, obviously, we all saw the Budman play, and that was entertaining. There was, you know, uh, Bloody and Dave Jack and, and the, the whole crew, Heathy and stuff, he was in that. And, um, so those days were fun. I was in high school going to those games, but um, you know when they played the Blackhawks, it was a big deal, and it was it was fun to watch. And fights and everything it was great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we used to always count on a few fights from the, especially when the the team from uh, where was the Carling Black Labels. You guys remember those guys? Guaranteed fight. Thanks, clears every time. Next team that we'd like to talk about, and I'm not sure, if, is Tom Champagne here tonight? No. No? Uh, Sacred Heart played on the rink downtown on Pleasant Street, right behind their church, which is now condominiums. They were formed in 1929-1930, and they concluded play after the 1952 campaign. At times, and you'll well, that picture there is down on their rink, um, and I'll show the other uh, clips in one second. But at times, 1,200 fans would line the boards, snow most of the time would be almost up to the top of the boards on the outside. I remember seeing a picture of Tom Champagne's father before he started playing for them, uh, standing on top of the snowbank as a, a youngster. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, in fact, Tom's father, Tom, who is still here in Concord on uh, Fruit Street, he's, according to uh, our records, uh, is the last surviving member of that Sacred Heart hockey team. Some of you might, might not know that the team hosted, before the Oslo Olympics, the, USA, the U.S. hockey team came to Concord and played a game against the Sacred Heart team, uh, Sacred Heart was up after two periods. They may have gone in to uh, get warm between periods, came out, end up losing the game. So I don't know what they had in the locker rooms, but uh, <laughs> something happened. They lost the game eight to six. And in the following video that we'll show in a second, take note of the 
gold judge's uh, position. No thank you, as far as I'm concerned, but back in those days, this is where the gold judges were. Chris, if you'd run those. of Tara Mounsey uh, winning her uh, Olympic gold medal, which I think everybody probably remembers that photograph uh, on the ice. Terrific. There's one other uh, story I wanted to tell about the Olympics. In fact, the 1932 Olympics. Uh, most of you probably aren't aware, but this George Chase right here, his grandfather, John Chase, was the captain of the 1932 Olympics hockey team, which Doug Everett played for. So he guided them in uh, Oslo, uh, and uh, the family had given the New Hampshire Legends of Hockey, not shown here tonight, video footage of the 1932 Olympics in Lake Placid for pretty much every sport you can almost imagine, sled dog racing, ice dancing, uh, ski jumping, uh, the toboggan, not the toboggan, the uh, bobsled runs, hockey inside and outside in Lake Placid at that time in 1932. So there's uh, three connections really to the city of Concord, our two Olympians, and then of course John Chase captaining the 1932 Winter Olympic hockey team. Of course the Everett Arena uh, didn't open, uh, we've talked about that earlier, till. November of 1965, so not everyone enjoyed a covered rink in dressing rooms. Um, in fact, I think one of the games, I think maybe the very first game that was played there to open the rink up, I, I, I think I still recall it, is Dartmouth against UNH yes. uh, just before that in uh, earlier November, um, that, that season. Uh, any good stories about those early days skating outside? Ken, you probably would have some. You probably all have some. What is your uh, fondest memories and what did you hate most about it? I know I hated the cold. I hated the time I skates outside when your fingers wouldn't even move. Well, the unfortunate thing is that we had a big incident that happened. Um, I came down with the flu and uh, our Concord Shamrocks were playing the Alpine Club. And of course, the Alpine Club is primarily love of wearing strong, strong, strong French background. And uh, our referee in chief was John Tarzan Healy. I think a lot of you probably remember John. He, didn't, he was a strong ECAC official. And he was our referee in chief. And uh, our team, the Shamrocks, were playing the Alpine Club. They said, I was not there at the game. But the story was that uh, Ralph Terrian, a defenseman for the Alpine Club, pulled down John Tuke's, John Healy's Tuke, and punched him in the nose and broke John's nose. So sure enough, I heard that story. I mean, we had a hearing and uh, Ralph Terrian was banned from playing hockey anywhere in the United States. But um, that gives you an idea of some of the rough and tumble stuff that, that, that was going on. You talk about excitements with George, you said, but, there was always a fight going on somewhere. Yeah. But, uh, With certain teams, definitely. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. 
I wanted to point out, uh, talking about uh, Tara Mounsey earlier, and George, I think we'll have you maybe address the question, but uh, uh, in the monitor, I came across through the uh, microfilm at the State Library article and photograph of uh, Doug Everett, who organized and coached uh, girls hockey in a hockey league. There were three teams at White Park, 1936, in 1937, as well as the subsequent year. Some of those last names you might recognize, not sure if I'm gonna pronounce this first one correctly, Ian Inuzo, Inuzo, I-A-N-U-Z-Z-O, Marshan, we all know Marshan, Champagne, Marquis, Ferretra, Martin, Cozy, and Andrews were just some of those names. Uh, George, on this one, um, what do you recall about women's hockey in the era, era before and after Title IX in 1973? Can you address that? Uh, I'm not sure I can that well, but I do remember that's when um, St. Paul started the girls' uh, women's team, uh, early 70s, and uh, they had quite a collection of interesting players there who went on to play for college teams, actually. Um, yeah, my wife has a, she started playing at uh, Title Line. she started playing at Middlebury, at, uh, and she was on, it was such a unique thing back in those days that they had a story on the national news about women playing hockey, you know, at Middlebury College. And, um, you know, there was Kathy Molson was on the team. I remember she was an instigator of Molson Beer. She was from up in, up in uh, Montreal. And, um, but even then, you know, half the girls on the team were wearing figure skates and they were, you know, going up and down the boards doing their toe picks. So. <laughs> I remember what Tara said when they interviewed her at the Olympics. They asked her about obstacles that she faced growing up to play hockey. They said, were you ever, did you face any difficulties playing? And she had a great line that I think says, all you need to hear about Concord hockey. She says, no, they always let me play with the boys. And that's all you need to know about what happened here. Those girls who played Concord hockey before there was a girls program were always playing with the boys. Didn't make any difference. And if the girls' teams weren't, uh, didn't, uh, weren't good enough, they played with the boys. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that was a key thing because a lot of towns, there were obstacles mm -hmm. put up to girls playing with boys. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a matter of fact, lots of times the girls were better than the boys. <laughs> well, I believe our time is winding down, but we can't think th thank the uh, Concord Historical Society enough for letting us talk a little bit about the history of Concord here in New Hampshire. I think we're going to talk to them later about the possibility of a 24-hour podcast on hockey, which I think we could fill with these guys, certainly, and a few other guests. So stay tuned and keep, uh, keep an eye on the New Hampshire Historical Society website. Thank you very much. Jim, why don't we let there be a couple of questions? Sure. The, do we have a couple of questions from our audience here tonight? You got the experts here. If if we don't, we maybe we'll take a phone call. We we'll take a phone call yeah. if we can get it. <laughs> a comment. I, uh, you're talking about girls doing the party. Uh, I, I recall when I was 12 years old. My mother, Olga, strapped on the pads for going to my dad and stole it from Johnson. And they had a women's game down at Everett Arena. I can't all remember. I don't know how to get on the ice, but. So it was pretty unique, and uh, I remember you know, chairman of the Well, that's great. So uh, goaltending runs in the family, certainly. What, what, how about you? You're a defenseman. Well, I, I didn't want those nine-mile-an-hour things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just want to say one thing. No talk about hockey in Cochrane. Well, to end, without mentioning Dick Ryerson, the first two state championships were won by Dick Ryerson, and it would be really criminal if we had a discussion here about hockey, all the guys that played for Ryer would say, what happened to us? Mm -hmm. First two state championships 
in the history of Concord, won by Dick Ryerson. And he always told me he never won a state championship with his best team. His best teams were the two off years. But a great coach and a real fundamental part of the city. Absolutely. Here, here. Yeah, nice. definitely. Rest yeah. in peace. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? You got one? Yeah, one question here. I just had a comment. Um, I grew up in Pennacook and uh, used to go and watch the, Con the Eastern Olympics. And Ryan Brandt was my science teacher at Merrimack Valley High School. Uh, I wasn't in high school, I was in junior high. And it was a big deal to go down Saturday night to watch the games. Now, somebody brought up the rivalry between the Blackhawks mm -hmm. and the Eastern Olympics. And they were bench clearing brawls, but there were fights in the stands, too. <laughs> As a kid, I was like, oh, Jesus. You know, because it was pretty scary at times. But it was great. It was awesome. And I really appreciate all of you. One more. One more question, anyone? Well, how did you enjoy it, huh? Thank you.